welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 47, The Pukachev Rebellion. Last episode, Catherine showed her people the type of gut she had when she volunteers to be inoculated against the dreaded disease smallpox. She also happily takes on the Turks in battle, as well as further degrading the position of the majority of Russians, the serfs. As we mentioned last week, Denis Diderot, the famous philosopher and writer who Catherine had corresponded with over the years, came to St. Petersburg to meet his benefactor. The visit was to last for almost two years, and their conversations were to cover subjects ranging from the education of Grand Duke Paul to the treatment of serfs and the ongoing war effort against the Turks. Their meetings were totally informal, with Diderot shouting at times, waving his arms, and acting as if he were an old friend at a tavern. Catherine commented that after a few meetings with the philosopher, she had to put a table between themselves because after the meeting she would walk away, quote, with bruises on my knees and black and blue spots on my thighs. The arguments they had almost always turned to the treatment of the people, especially the serfs, which Diderot always called slaves. Catherine objected to this. She truly believed that they were, as Troyat puts it, quote, There were no slaves in Russia, only peasants attached to the soil. These serfs, she declared, were spiritually independent, even if they were subject to some physical constraint. There really seems to be an intellectual disconnect between the reality of what was going on with the serfs and what Catherine perceived the situation to be. But in no sense is she really unique among rulers of the, ancient, of the 18th century. She's quite the norm. The condition and discussion of serfdom in Russia is something I plan to do in a Slapshot episode on or in the near future as we kind of get closer to the reign of Alexander II, who would free them by proclamation. One comment by Catherine is very telling about the liberal ideas that Diderot presented and what she thought about them. Quote, Monsieur Diderot, I have listened with great pleasure to all the inspirations of your brilliant mind, but all your grand principles, which I understand very well, would do splendidly in books and very badly in practice. And all your plans for reform, you are forgetting the difference between our two positions. You work only on paper, which accepts anything, is smooth and flexible, and offers no obstacles either to your imagination or to your pen, while I, poor Empress, work on human skin, which is far more sensitive and touchy. Catherine was beginning to grow tired of Diderot and the Landgravine family of the Grand Duchess Natalia, but it was something else that made her uneasy and wishing the guests would all go away. There was a rebellion going on in the southwest, in the Urals, and it was led by a mysterious man by the name of Emilien Pugachev. There were whispers throughout the court of St. Petersburg that a hurricane of rebellion was taking place, and the leader was claiming to be either Catherine's late husband, Peter III, or was claiming to be led by his memory. Either way, this band of rabble-rousers was gaining strength and ravaging the countryside. Before we get into the reasons for the rebellion or what went on during this period, let's talk briefly about who this Pugachev guy was. Born on January 21, 1742, as the son of a small-time Don Cossack landowner, he was, by all accounts, an unremarkable child. He joined the military at the age of 17 to fight in the Seven Years' War and was married at 18 to Sofia Nedzhuheva, with whom he had five children with. His military skills were above average, and he served the Russian army well. His fellow soldiers thought him a bit of a braggart, as one time he claimed that his sword was given to him by his godfather, Peter the Great. From here, Pugachev seems to have become disenchanted with army life, 
as he left his post and headed home. He was captured, charged with desertion, but within a couple of days he escaped. Arrested a couple of years later, he once again escaped from prison. This is when Pugachev decides to impersonate Peter III. He was on his way to feel out a revolt led by Yak Cossacks. He was once again arrested and sent to Kazan, but he learned a number of lessons about what motivated the men to revolt in the first place. Many thought he looked like Peter III, but that's somewhat ridiculous as they were nothing alike at all. But these were peasants, and they likely had no idea what the former Tsar looked like, and were probably duped by people who claimed that he was the real Peter who escaped the murder plot. People were so disenchanted with Catherine, hating all the taxes, the forced military service, and the tightening of the screws, so to say, on the serfs. They were ready to believe in anything. Pugachev also noted that there were many old believers who never accepted the changes that Patriarch Nikon had put into place a century before. He promised that if he came to power, he'd throw out the German princess and return the church to the side of the old believers. This appealed greatly to the masses of the uneducated peasants. He began to draw thousands of people to his army in late 1773, and began to ravage the countryside, murdering all who were in the upper classes. Pukachev began to send out edicts, have coins with his likeness made, and created another government to challenge the one in St. Petersburg. As Troyat puts it, quote, The children of the nobles were massacred, the women raped, and then had their throats cut. Landowners were mutilated, flayed alive, burned, hacked to pieces. The time had come to turn the world upside down. To the starving and humiliated would go to the seats to on high. To the former masters, mud and death. If you were to find a corollary in history, you need only look at the most famous slave revolt of all time, that of the one led by Spartacus in the first century B.C. The winds of discontent ran deep in the hearts of the serfs, who were tired of the abuse heaped upon them and the burden of taxes that the nobles laid on their shoulders. In Russian history, only a hundred years or so before, Stenka Razin had led a similar rebellion. Only this one was a whole lot bigger. Catherine sent out a number of armies to fight Pugachevs, but they were unsuccessful as they were outnumbered by quite a bit. There was another hindrance, and that was the fact that Russia was still fighting a war with the Turks. On one town and after another, they fell to the mass of misfits, mostly small forts and towns, until they took the city of Kazan. Next to fall was Nizhny Novgorod. Catherine was beginning to get anxious. As she wrote, quote, Two years ago, in the center of the empire, I had the plague. Now, on its borders, I have a political plague that is causing us much concern. With the help of God, we will prevail, for the bunch of beggars have neither reason nor order nor cleverness on their side. They are only brigands come from everywhere, headed by an impostor as bold as his is shameless. We'll all certainly end with the rope. But what a prospect for me, who did not like the gibbet. European opinion will think we have gone back to the days of Ivan Vasilievich, or Ivan the Terrible. Catherine had to end the war with the Ottoman Empire, but they proved stubborn. But the war was not going well for the Turks, and after suffering a number of major defeats, they signed a treaty at Kuchuk Kanyajari. In July 1774. The peace agreement gave Russia huge concessions, including access to the Black and Aegean Sea. Catherine had accomplished what Peter the Great had dreamt about, a port in the south. Now she could concentrate on Pugachev, and she did it with zeal. She sent Nikita Panin's brother, Peter, to take the rebellion down. Tens of thousands of Russia's finest soldiers, along with cavalry and artillery, was sent down the Volga. 
the rebels turned and began to retreat, which caused mass panic and desertions. After his defeat at Sarepta on September 14, 1774, Pugachev's own lieutenants captured him, turning him over to authorities, begging for their lives. Catherine, as she had been like all the autocrats of Russia before her, would have had Pugachev tortured before executing him. But the Empress was unlike her predecessors. She refused to have anyone tortured as she found it morally reprehensible. But unlike Elizabeth, she did believe in executions, especially if they committed a crime against the state. Pugachev by now was a broken man. He was transported eventually to Moscow in an iron cage. The trial was held, but the outcome was already in the bag. He fainted a number of times, causing the judges to be concerned that he would die before the execution. Catherine said of the condemned man, quote, The Marquis de Pugachev, of whom you speak to me again, has lived like a scoundrel and will die like a coward. He cannot read or write, but he is a bold and determined man. So far, there is not the least indication that he was the instrument of any foreign power. It is to be supposed that Monsieur Pugachev is a master brigand and no man's servant. He hopes for pardon because of his courage. If it were only I whom he offended, his reasoning would be correct, and I should pardon him. But this is a case involving the empire, which has its laws. He was mercifully decapitated quickly, then drawn and quartered. While Pugachev was now dead, what he represented was not. It was stronger and would be finally unleashed in the 1917 rebellion, 142 years after his execution, when the Bolshevik Revolution took place. The repercussions from the Pugachev Rebellion were dramatic and brutal. Thousands were executed for their roles all over the country. Repression of the serfs took on a new brutality, which Catherine seemed to be blissfully unaware of. Hatred of the nobles and the government as a whole was deep-seated in the people by now. There are some historians who claim that Pugachev's rebellion halted the liberal reforms that Catherine was working on, with some claiming that she even had plans to liberate the serfs. Nothing in my studies of the subject, especially the Empress's own writings, convinced me that she had any intention of easing the burden on the peasants of Russia. Instead, I believe that she felt that it was God's will that they were tied to the land, and that the place of the nobility was also God-given, as was her place as autocrat, and to change things would be to change God's will. The nobility and the landowners are who held up the empire, not the people. That was the way that Catherine thought. Just when the empress thought that things were getting better, another pretender to the throne popped up in Europe. A woman was passing herself off as the daughter of Elizabeth I, and the real heir to the throne of Russia. The impostor was calling herself by numerous titles, but the one she used as her claim to the throne was Elizabeth Terakonova, or Elizabeth II. The always nervous Catherine ordered her captured, as she instructed in a letter to Alexei Orlov, sees, quote, this creature who has so insolently bestowed upon herself a name and descent to which she is by no means entitled. She told Orlov that if he needed to bombard the sea town, the seaside town she was in, so be it. But they are to deliver her post haste. Instead, Alexis hatched a plan to con the young woman by saying that he believed in her claim, was going to help her take the throne from Catherine, and would marry her. He staged a wedding aboard a ship headed to St. Petersburg, but after the wedding, no Alexis. She was surrounded by sailors and put into a cell on a boat. When she arrived in St. Petersburg, Elizabeth, Elizabeth was thrown into a dungeon in the St. Peter and Paul Fortress to stay until she died of tuberculosis on December 4, 1775. 
Next week, we reintroduce a giant of a man, the love of Catherine's life, Grigory Alexandrovich Potemkin. And now for this week in Russian history for the week of May 1st through the 7th. In 1605, the controversial patriarch Nikon, the seventh patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, was born. In 1682, Tsar Fyodor III of Russia died. In 1729, the focus of these podcasts, Catherine II of Russia, Empress, was born. In 1762, Russia and Prussia signed the Treaty of St. Petersburg. In 1840, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, the great Russian composer, was born. In 1795 in St. Petersburg, Russian scientist Alexander Stepanovich Popov demonstrates to the Russian Physical and Chemical Society his invention, the Popov lightning detector, a primitive radio receiver. In some parts of the former Soviet Union, the anniversary of this day is celebrated as Radio Day. In 1920, the Treaty of Moscow. Soviet Russia recognizes the independence of the Democratic Republic of Georgia only to invade the country six months later. In 1945, in World War II, we have the fall of Berlin. The Soviet Union announces the capture of Berlin and Soviet soldiers hoist their red flag over the Reichstag building. And in 2008, Dmitry Medvedev is sworn in as Russia's president. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. For those of you with iPhones, you can download the Russian Rulers app at the iPhone store. Also, don't forget to visit the website at russianrulers.podhoster.com. Become a Facebook friend at Russian Rulers History Podcast. Leave a comment, make a suggestion, and ask a question. But as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.